Um, okay, hello, thanks so much. And you'll tell us about time yes. as well. Okay. Um, so I'm super honored to be here at Data Power. Uh, I put, I'm Catherine Dignazio. I put my new title up here. So as of January 2020, I'm going to be starting up a lab called the Data Plus Feminism Lab in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. So today I'm going to talk to you about Lauren Klein and I's book project, which is called Data Feminism. So Data Feminism, our book, comes from a fairly simple motivation. So data and AI have been heralded, you know, one billion times as the new oil. Uh, but there's, there's been really significant pushback in recent years from folks in this community and many others. Um, and what's interesting is that it's come primarily from uh, women of color, white women, indigenous people, LGBTQ people, and more. And what they say in various ways, um, which range from being academic to poetic, um, is that data and AI are actually really not all that new. Um, they are actually the continuation of patterns of structural oppression that are hundreds of years old. Um, and so these are some of the projects that we you know, reference in the book uh, that have been inspirations to us. Um, Sophia Noble's work, Virginia Eubanks' work, the reporting of ProPublica with Julia Angwin, uh, Mimi Onuoha, who I'm going to talk about in a second, the Algorithmic Justice League, uh, and the book Indigenous Statistics by Maggie Walter and Chris Anderson. Um, so this is sort of the ground that led Lauren Klein and I to ask the question, what might a feminist data science look like? So are there ways to use and to refuse data that do not uphold structural oppression? And what might need to change about our current practices, like actual practices of data science and data communication to actually get us there? So for us, this was a process of standing on the shoulders of our feminist foremothers to try to connect their words and actions to computation, even for folks that weren't necessarily kind of writing about computation. Um, okay, so Data Feminism is a book. Um, it's co-written by myself and Lauren Klein. My background is in art and design and software development. I'm a woman in tech. I identify as a hacker mama. Uh, I also occupy a lot of very dominant identities as well. Uh, I'm white, cis, heterosexual, middle class, academic, and Lauren shares those identities with me. <clears throat> she's also a historian, and she's a digital humanities scholar at Georgia Tech. And she likes to say that she's a professional nerd, and she likes to do things like apply machine learning in order to analyze the food prepared in Thomas Jefferson's home. So the status of the book project is that we've just turned in the final revision. I'm trying to find my mouse here. Ah, there it is. Uh, so we've just turned in our final revision, and it's going to be available in spring 2020 from MIT Press. We did an open draft and review process. You can actually read the first draft of the book. Um, and we got really amazing peer comments and feedback during that process. So there's really significant revisions to the second uh, this is the second version, and I just want to thank uh, Aristea <laughs> for being a reviewer, um, and then if anybody else in the room was, um, thank you as well. <laughs> uh, we drew a lot on the really generous feedback that we received in that process. Um, <clears throat> and so the one last thing before I delve into the concepts is that in terms of who this book is for, it is for people like us who are here in this room, but we also wrote it to be accessible to students, uh, to newcomers, to practitioners. And in that latter category, we're talking about uh, data scientists in industry or government, visualization professionals, journalists, librarians, and community-based organizations that we work with in other aspects of our work. Um, so specifically those folks who want to think about how to work with data in an anti-oppressive and equitable way. Okay, because we've been getting questions about this, <laughs> I want to clarify what data feminism is and what it is not. So um, data, science, uh, data feminism is not data science about women. Um, it's not data science by women. And it is not data science that demonstrates the differences between the genders. Like it's not data science that's like, this like, quantitative information proves that men are different from women because of something or other. 
Um, and here I put white in parentheses because often when we say woman or women, um, the sort of implied category here is that the white woman or the white sort of middle class or elite woman stands in for all women. Um, this is really antithetical to the definition of feminism that we're mobilizing in the book. Um, so the definition of feminism that we are working with comes explicitly from black feminists who are based in the US and is grounded in intersectional feminism. Um, so intersectionality, I probably don't need to explain, but it's a term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be explained by only one dimension of difference, like gender. So we have to be talking about the intersection and the compounding of many factors and forces that produce inequality. So that's patriarchy, racism, classism, colonialism, and so on. Um, and so Lauren and I are both based in the US, and if you read the book, you'll see that we end up really intentionally focusing a lot of attention at the intersection of gender and race. Um, and that's really due to our location in the US, where so much structural oppression has racism as it, at its source. Um, so what is data feminism? So data feminism is data science that exposes and challenges intersecting oppressions. Data science by and censoring minoritized people. Counter data science about the injustices created by mainstream data science. Um, and data feminism always includes gender as a category of analysis. So sort of just as we have a kind of, we have a somewhat long tradition of counter cartography, we're basically in the book proposing a counter data science. And we're proposing the principles by which that counter data science would proceed. Um, and those principles are these, and so these are, this is actually how the book is structured, structured around seven chapters that each of them talks about one of the principles of data feminism. And so we drew these out from looking across fem feminist scholarship and activism across many different fields um, that include but are not limited to uh, the digital humanities, critical cartography and GIS, um, human-computer interaction, science and technology studies, um, and then work in uh, uh, journalism and design and uh, so on. Uh, and of course, critical data studies as well. So I don't have time to go over all of these, but I wanted to talk about a couple of um, examples that we discussed. The, the book is very example-driven. So I want to talk about a, a couple of examples that hopefully illustrate these principles in action. So this, the first principle that we'll talk about here in relation to Mimi's work is this principle of examine power. So who benefits and who is silenced by data and data regimes is really central to the feminist project. Um, we talk about feminism as a kind of practice of asking who questions, who benefits, who does the work, um, whose values are being mobilized. Um, so we tell the story of artist Mimi Onuoha's efforts to collect what she calls missing data sets. Um, so these missing data sets are data sets that, you know, a reasonable person would imagine that they exist, but they actually don't exist. Um, so these data sets include things like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime, or people excluded from public housing because of criminal records. Um, I don't know how many folks here follow ProPublica, but their recent reporting about maternal mortality is another interesting example of a missing data set. So in the US, we literally don't know how many women are dying in childbirth in the US because it's missing, it um, goes uncollected. Um, and so when it comes to women and to gender nonconforming people, these missing data sets are not oversights or accidents. When you look across them, they form a pattern in which we systematically fail to collect data on those bodies that depart from the default. And here the default would be the, the white, male, elite, cis, heteros, and so on. Um, and so in the book we relate these data silences to other kinds of gendered silences, um, which exist because of what the sociologist Patricia Hill Collins calls the matrix of domination. Okay. Um, so this is illustrating the principle of challenge power. So for example, um, femicides in Mexico. So femicides are gender-based killings. Um, so femicides in Mexico and in 
the other countries where they occur, which are all of them, <laughs> uh, are another case of missing data sets. So in the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero, who she resolved to head sort of straight towards the problem and collect this missing data set herself. Um, so femicides are legally defined as crimes in a handful of countries, including Mexico, but the state does not systematically collect data on femicides. So this is a subject of emerging public anger in Latin America. So if you, I would encourage you to go check out the hashtag ni una menos, like not one uh, less. Um, so we won't tolerate one less woman being alive in this world, basically. Um, because of the way in which the state neglects to fully implement its own laws and provisions. So uh, Maria got frustrated by this and um, she basically has now compiled the largest open archive of femicides in Mexico. She is an individual, she's not affiliated with an organization, and she spends two to four hours a day logging femicides on a Google map that she calls from media reports. Um, and she has helped families locate loved ones, provided data to journalists, and testified in front of Mexico's Congress. Um, so her work illustrates this kind of form of feminist counter data, so activist data collection that steps in when the state and other counting institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic <coughs> safety of their population, so a kind of way of challenging power through the collection. Um, Third, okay, one of the principles of data feminism is to consider context. Um, oh gosh, okay, I might skip the last one. <laughs> so considering context means being sensitive to the times when the data should never, um, really it cannot speak for itself and should never be allowed to speak for itself. Um, and so an example of this is actually uh, reporting done by my journalism students at Emerson College. Um, an example of this is sexual assault data on college campuses. So these are numbers that cannot be taken at face value because of the imbalances, the power imbalances in the data collection environment. Um, if you just go download this uh, Cleary report data, the Cleary, uh, the Cleary Act specifies a, it's a federal data collection effort that um, uh, has reports about sexual assault on all college campuses across the US. Um, you would come to a conclusion that Williams College in Western Massachusetts has this epidemic of sexual assault happening and Boston University in urban Boston um, is doing really great because they have very few cases. But the truth is likely closer to the exact opposite of that conclusion. Um, but you have to understand the context of the data. Um, so the Cleary Act is federally mandated and it's self-reported. Um, educational institutions do not want to have high numbers of sexual assault. Uh, their paying clients are parents who want to ensure safety, so no, no college wants to have high numbers. Um, and then of course we have the uh, fact that it's, very, it's a very hostile climate in most cases for survivors to come forward because of uh, stigma and bias and victim blaming and lack of support. Um, so when my students investigated this, they found that paradoxically um, the places with the higher numbers are actually the places that are putting resources into making the climate more supportive for survivors versus those that are kind of suppressing this and ignoring it and underreporting it in a way by design. Um, but so in, in this case, if we let the numbers speak for themselves, they would be telling a story that is basically just untrue and false. Um, so considering context becomes a way to account for power differentials in the data setting. And I'm going to skip this one, but I was going to talk about this principle of uh, legitimize affect and embodiment, or elevate emotion. Um, so I only got to give you a couple examples here, um, but these are some of the ways in which we're talking about how um, feminist theories and activism can inform um, the practice and the doing and the design of data. Um, and so here are things I would love to discuss with you, so things that are on my mind. Um, academic community partnerships, how do we like work from an ethical place where we partner outside of academia? Um, how do we make feminist decolonial labs? Feminism in a global context, and then building solidarity across intersectional lines of difference. Um, so thank you so much, looking forward. And, um,